Okay, so for uh, this video, I want to walk through some some basic background information and some aspects of running graded exercise tests. Now, in lab, each group has already done a lab doing a graded exercise test, and so you've gone through some of the basic step by step of going from uh, prepping your subject to getting supine and sitting and standing measures to then doing the test, uh, getting those measures during the test, and then finishing the test and having the subject sitting back down, looking at the EKG, and so on and so forth. So I want to go through some of what we look for in these tests. What are some things that we're looking to measure? And understanding that when we're doing functional exercise testing like this, um, there's actually a few things we're often looking for. Now, in the case of graded exercise tests where we're doing an EKG, uh, one of the big things we're looking at is evaluation. And here on the bottom here, evaluation for potential cardiac, uh, cardiovascular disease. However, when we are engaging in this kind of exercise testing, we may be also looking at some other symptoms. Is there shortness of breath? Um, what is their functional capacity? In other words, how much uh, physical ability do they have? Are they able to, uh, do they have high enough uh, aerobic capacity to climb a flight of stairs, or climb two flights of stairs, to walk a mile? And so getting a little bit more information than just simply is this, is there cardiovascular disease present? Is there not? Uh, is part of the reason why we do exercise testing. That's part of the reason during the test, uh, we didn't just ask how they were feeling. We also asked if they had any pain, any shortness of breath, any chest pain, things like that. So we can analyze those symptoms as the test goes on. Now, when we do a test, and as each group realized, there's different protocols we can choose. And the whole idea, typically, of a graded exercise test is we want to evaluate an individual as an activity gets increasingly more difficult. And so typically, all these protocols we choose have some form of a continuous test environment where the activity will start with something minor intensity and increase over some amount of time or interval or stage to increasing intensities. So whether this is the Bruce protocol, bulky, uh, some of the groups used one of our, our cancer fatigue protocols. All of those uh, have this similar makeup. They start at different speeds and grades. Uh, they have different changes in elevation. They increase in different intensities and in different amount of times. Um, so, as we mentioned, there's a reason why we do these tests. We're trying to assess uh, diagnostically, uh, to assess in today, and what we did in lab today, was to assess if there is some uh, loss of oxygen to muscle cells that's causing that ST segment to drop ST, drop ST depression, as we've called it before. And so we're, we're looking to see, is there some changes there? Is there what we call myocardial ischemia? Is there some lack of oxygen ischemia to the myocardium, the heart, that's causing changes in what we see in EKG? The concern being is that if there are, then we're likely going to see if that continues at higher intensities, we'll see more severe heart issues develop. And this could be anything from arrhythmias to things even potentially more severe. And so that's one of the reasons we, we do these diagnostics is to be able to assess where individuals are. And then the second part of that is that when we have these individuals active when they're exercising, the data from this test allows us to assess, to assess what is a, a healthy, allowable limit to that activity? Now, the tests we did in lab, most of you are incredibly healthy, so there are no limits. Uh, you had no changes in the EKG, so we would say, yeah, there's no limits to your, to your exercise activity. However, if we had done a test on someone, and let's say we found that five minutes into the test at a certain speed or grade, let's just say 2% uh, grade, 2% speed miles per hour, 10% grade. Let's say we begin to see one, one and a half millimeters of ST depression. Okay. Well, what we want to communicate to that person is when they're running, they're being active, what exercise they're doing, anytime they hit that intensity level, they're likely going to experience the same symptoms. Whether they was on our treadmill, whether it's them walking around the mall, uh, whether it's them chasing their dog in the backyard, uh, all of those, if that activity reaches that intensity, they are going to experience those 
changes in ST depression. Now, the only difference is that in our lab, we can see it. And when they're chasing Rover in the backyard, we can't. And so this is where we would want to set up a, a prescription, a limit on that activity. And we would tell the individual, hey, this is where we are. We really don't want you to, in, to exercise with an intensity above a certain point. And we usually put that in METs, and we try to figure that out using our ACSM equations. And for this subject, we may say, okay, we, do, you know, we don't want this individual to exercise over six and a half METs. Now, um, it doesn't mean they're not able to. They probably are able to. Um, but it's at that point that we know if they hit that intensity, that they will begin to experience ST depression, which is a sign of myocardial ischemia. And that's not something that's good for the subject, that the increase of heart attack is exponential at that point. So that's some of the reasons why we do this. Um, now, as you saw during the test, we can measure a lot of different things. Uh, during the test we did in lab, we looked at heart rate and blood pressure and RPE. We also asked the individual if they had any signs or symptoms, chest pain, dyspnea, things like that. If we wanted, as we've done in other tests, we could assess expiratory gas, ventilatory responses, VO2, VCO2, things like that. We didn't for this test, because uh, again, that's just an added variable that we were a little more focused on the EKG. But uh, there are obviously other things we have measured in the past that we can continue to look at. Um, now, your book kind of goes through each of these a little more specifically as far as how we typically monitor these, when we do these. And the ACSM does have some guidelines here regarding, okay, so if we're going to measure EKG, you know, it should be continuous. In other words, you don't just do it every few seconds. Um, you especially want to make sure you get the changes right before you increase to a stage. And then after exercise, you want to make sure you, you clearly monitor that because post-exercise is a window where we often see a high number of potential cardiac events. Uh, and so the same thing with heart rate, monitoring heart rate during the test, doing that continuously, doing that accurately. Uh, blood pressure, as we saw in lab, definitely a challenge getting accurate blood pressure. The individual is walking, uh, they're moving, obviously, which is a big challenge, uh, but doing everything we can to get the most accurate assessment of that, both before, during, and after exercise, and obviously during the most difficult part. And then signs and symptoms is something that we're always continually monitoring, we're continually asking, and a lot of that is getting a sense of the subject. How do they look? Do we see any outward signs or concerns? And then there's a part where we just ask those questions. Uh, there are times where an, a subject may be experiencing something, chest pain, for example, or a pain down an arm, where we may not inherently, by their facial expression, by changes in gait, we're not going to notice that. So those are situations we would want to ask them, even if we think they are fine. Hey, are you experiencing any chest pain, any shortness of breath, any pain anywhere? And then if they are, then begin to ask more specific questions about that. And those are things you, you have to continually ask. And it's, it's easy to just forget that. It's easy to see, hey, the subject looks fine, so I'm sure they are fine. But we do want to be aware of those things. And so we use things like an angina scale. Uh, angina is a word for chest pain. And this is very indicative. It's a very clear sign that there is potential um, myocardial ischemia occurring at that time. And so we want to know that. And if they say, yeah, yeah, I do have pain, we want to know, oh, how difficult is that on a scale of one to four? And we try to put words to these. Is it bearable? Is it moderate? Um, you know, is this the most severe pain you've ever had? Again, we just want to have a sense of what is this person experiencing? You know, unfortunately, with things like pain, there's not easy parameters for these. There's not a scale. There's not a test. You know, there's not some blood work. Um, there's not a number like heart rate or, or even EKG. So these are things we need to ask as far as angina, as far as pain. This is another pain scale we can use. Again, which, which gives us some numeric value to what our subject is experiencing. Now, is it a perfect scale? Of course not. Uh, but at least gives us some information as far as where the subject is and then how we should move forward accordingly. And the same thing with RPE and gas exchange. Uh, we want to, if we are measuring these, we want to make sure we're doing these fairly regularly during the test, uh, particularly 
at the end of each stage for a test and make sure we're doing that after the test as well. And again, with gas exchange, if we are doing gas exchange, yeah, that's something we want to look at uh, on a pretty continuous basis during the test. Uh, so RPE Borg scale, again, was something we've talked about a, a lot before. Um, in our lab, we use the regular Borg scale. There's a modified Borg scale that's used in other places as well. But again, just to the, an understanding of how does a subject, how hard do they feel like they're working at this point? Um, so there's typically pre-test instructions we go through as far as making sure there's consent. And a lot of this was done for you before lab. Uh, getting sheets out, getting equipment calibrated, organizing test forms, getting informed consent, uh, getting resting measurements, and then this is where you began to step in. Um, and then assessing other, any other physical components. Uh, so during some tests, we may want to measure body composition. Um, very commonly we do in the lab. Uh, we may, we may want to measure flexibility. And so, you know, understanding that there may be on top of this graded exercise test some other factors, some other variables we may want to assess. So there's typically a, an order to these. And, and general rule of thumb is if we're doing something cardiovascular like a graded exercise test, we tend to want to limit other tests we do because it can be difficult. Uh, now, in lab, obviously, the tests we do did, the protocols we used, not terribly difficult for for most of, most of you, but for individuals who their functional capacity is quite less, you know, doing a great exercise test is very difficult. And so often we don't really want to do a, a large number of other assessments, especially muscle strength, things that are going to involve a lot of energy, a lot of, a lot of functional capacity uh, during that same day. Uh, we want to be aware of what medications they take, which we'll talk about in class, room temperature, um, are there any issues that may affect the results of the test? Are they having a bad day <laughs> uh, with our cancer patients? Uh, you know, are they experiencing a lot of fatigue that day? If they are, that's probably not the, the best day to choose to assess uh, their maximal functional capacity. Uh, and the last thing we want to look at, and this is in your, your book, is understanding that there are going to be situations where we need to terminate the test, not because a subject is tired and done, but because there are some signs that clearly indicate this needs to occur. Uh, and so I'm not going to go through each of these, but there are some here you definitely want to know. Uh, there are some absolute indications, and the big ones we'll see is uh, ST elevation above one millimeter. Um, subject, subject obviously wants to stop. Uh, VTAC, if you see VTAC, stop the test. Uh, if the subject is getting ex extreme angina, the biggest one, if we're seeing blood pressure drop during the test, that's a big indication that something cardiovascularly is going wrong, and we certainly don't want to increase intensity any further. And so all of these are what we call absolute indications. In other words, these are things that no matter what, uh, we would want to stop this test. We would want to get the person off the treadmill, sitting, get an assessment, understand where they are, um, and be able to, to monitor them without the exercise activity going on. So these are what we call absolute indications. Now, there are also relative indications, and blood pressure is one of those. The big one is ST depression. And so it, it, this is probably the most important because if this gets severe, one, two millimeters, typically this is a sign that there is something going on in the heart. There's ischemia. And so that's a big, big, big indication. Probably the most important one on the list. Uh, there are other ones, severe shortness of breath. If they develop some abnormal arrhythmias like bundle branch block, uh, if there's increasing chest pain, um, if blood pressure really starts to get way too high, above 250 systolic, 115 diastolic. And so there's some other indicators here of relative concerns. Now, uh, these we don't have to stop the test. However, Generally, it's pretty recommended if you're going to see ST depression of a millimeter or two and you're starting to experience some chest pain, there's no need really to exercise them more. Okay, so I hope this is helpful for you. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. But either way, we will see you in class.